Welcome to the next lecture for Introduction to Remote Sensing. This is uh, my favorite lecture because it concerns LiDAR, which was or, or is my uh, speciality. Uh, LiDAR is an acronym for Light Detection and Ranging, and it's similar as an acronym to RADAR, which is Radio Wave Detection and Ranging. But here we're using lasers in uh, the visible and near infrared, some some lasers out in the mid infrared, but mostly uh, near infrared and visible. And the thing that's special about LIDAR is that you can measure the elevation of objects on the surface of Earth, the elevation of those objects. Um, and secondly, the second a thing that's interesting about LIDAR and kind of unique is that you can not only see the top surface of whatever you're looking at, but you can also see under um, vegetation so that you can see the bare earth. And that's what I'm showing here. The top is a, a hill shaded uh, digital surface model that is the maximum elevation model and beneath it is a similarly grayscale uh, processed bare earth elevation surface. So that's pretty much unique. Some people will argue that other systems can um, look beneath the canopy, but really LIDAR is the only one that can do it. And so it has a special place in remote sensing. So how does light detection and ranging work? Well, uh, here's a little cartoon I sketched up. And at the top, you have a, a laser and a receiver. Um, and a pulse of laser light is generated by the laser. And that light travels downward towards some object and then back up and into the receiver. And I know the light doesn't, doesn't quite go into the receiver when it comes up, but that's conceptually what I'm trying to get across. How do we know the range? Well, the range is um, the time and seconds it takes for the light to be emitted, reflected, and then absorbed by the receiver. Okay, so that's the time. You divide that by two because the pulse has to take a round trip. It's got to go all the way down and all the way back. And multiply that by the speed of light. So it's basically the speed of light times the amount of time uh, it takes uh, for the pulse to be emitted and returned, and that gives you your range. So for instance, if you have a 6,667 nanoseconds, nanosecond is a billionth of a second elapsed time, then that's a two kilometer round trip distance, and that means there must be, must be a one kilometer separation between the aircraft and the surface it intercepted. Now, there's always a, a question about horizontal movement. So if the plane is traveling at 200 miles per hour, um, so that's 89.4 meters per second, in 6,667 nanoseconds, the planes only moved uh, less than uh, six one hundredths of a centimeter, so not very far at all. And that's just because light is so tremendously quick. Now, the basic laser ranging method has been done since the 1960s, but it only became a practical tool in the 90s and really truly practical in the 2000s um, because suddenly you have available two things. First of all, you have GPS, so you can know where your plane is in three dimensions. And something called uh, an inertial measurement unit or um, an inertial navigation system, which allows you to know which way your, your plane is pointed. So, and that's what, what roll, pitch, and yaw are. Those are the three components of, of where you're pointed. So if you know where you are, you know where your, your plane is pointing, then 
If you know where the plane is pointing, you know where the laser is pointing. You combine that with the range and you get an X, Y, and Z coordinate on the surface of the Earth. And we sometimes talk about that as being a triplet. So what are the applications of LIDAR? Just very briefly to give you a sense of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, the primary commercial use of LIDAR remote sensing is uh, in the collection of topographic data. So on the left, we have a hillside with typical pseudocolor um, um, illustration. So blue areas are low elevation, red areas are upper elevation. And at the bottom, we have the same thing, but for an urban area. So you can see not only individual buildings, but you can see their height as a color code. Other LIDAR applications that involve topography, uh, here we have the case of a landslide, and you might want to know, for instance, is that big chunk of the earth going to slide again? Um, well, you can run a laser scanner over it and put that into models and tell whether or not it's probably um, stable or not. A lot of geology applications of LIDAR. Here's another one. So what I'm showing you there is um, Southern Bainbridge Island in Puget Sound in Washington. And you can see, like most places around uh, the Puget Sound, this is a very heavily forested area. Um, you can't see um, the ground surface from the air. Um, and this was uh, data was collected as part of a project to look at micro faults I talked about these very briefly. Um, micro faults are um, like faults, they're geologic faults, but rather than being uh, large and obviously uh, seen like the San Andreas fault, they're, well, they're micro, uh, they're small. There isn't much surface um, exposure of the fault itself. And so that we have a shaded relief image and it's been illuminated from the south uh, and it's a this is a 12 foot resolution DEM um, and if you look carefully sort of where the the lower part of the island meets the northern part of the island uh, there's a, a white line and that's the micro fault the interesting thing about this is that these faults can be as destructive when they give as something like the San Andreas fault. They're micro in size, but in fact, they can have a huge impact. And the whole Puget Sound lowland area is shot through with these micro faults. And that's a big problem because Seattle and again, I think we talked about this. Seattle was built on fill, fill dirt that they brought in. And when jolted, that fill dirt can become plastic. That is, it becomes easily moved. And so Seattle is based or built on an area where uh, a sharp jolt could lead to buildings falling down. So they wanted to have a, a inventory of all these micro faults and they used LIDAR to get it. Another urban area um, here, it's been set up in sort of a wireframe, but you can see the heights of the various objects. You can see a bridge there near the center, and you can see some commercial buildings. Uh, my applications are forestry and forest planning. Um, if you look at the top slide, um, or top figure, you can see a power line uh, in an area that's forested. And you have to maintain the areas beneath these power lines because if the vegetation gets too tall, then you wind, wind up in a situation where you can't go in to maintain it or it might in, uh, intercept one of those um, power cables. So it's actually worth it for these companies to fly LIDAR over the 
uh, transects where the power lines go in order to figure out where to send their uh, maintenance crews to cut down trees to keep the whole area clear. And here's a landscape where they've used LIDAR to uh, identify individual tree crowns. So each one of those has been colored so that it's sort of got a unique uh, color relative to its neighbor. So let's go through the steps in the LIDAR remote sensing process. The first thing you got to do is create a, a laser or LIDAR pulse. So what is a laser pulse? Well, laser is an acronym that I really like because it does what it says and it says what it does. It's light amplified by the stimulated emission of radiation. That is, there's some uh, material, could be uh, solid, can be liquid, I think it could be gas as well, and you're going to stimulate it somehow, either with light or electricity, and that's gonna cause uh, an amplified emission of radiation. So how does laser light differ from ordinary light? Uh, well, it's monochromatic. That is, a laser emits in only a very small portion of the spectrum. You know, the, the spectrum, the color that it's going to emit is going to be only um, within a few nanometers of what you're expecting. It's intense. So in that narrow range of wavelengths, the laser's output energy can exceed that of the sun or any other known source. You can know this by just taking a laser pointer outside and on a sunny day and directing it toward the ground. You can see that the light from the laser is much brighter than the sun itself. It's directional. That is, a uh, laser only emits light in a very well-defined direction, and it's coherent. So lasers emit light at only one phase. All of the phases of the light are uh, stacked up so that they're the same. So why is, are any of these things important? Well, monochromaticity is important because you have this narrow range of wavelengths and there you can put filters on that um, on the wavelength to block other portions of the spectrum which means you're getting rid of background radiation or for instance back scattered sunlight so that makes your signal clearer it's also advantageous because we can precisely choose the wavelengths we want um, so we might want to use green or near ir for various applications and we can uh, get that with great specificity with LIDAR. Um, what about the fact that it's powerful, directional, low divergent, and coherent? Well, laser beams can travel long distances with little attenuation or power reduction. So this allows you to project them onto distant objects, like in application you might know of light laser guided bombs where you can light something up with a laser and a bomb will follow the, the track of to that laser spot and light of remote sensing from airborne or spaceborne platforms. So we emit um, pulses of laser light from satellites that are, you know, around 400 kilometers and there's enough energy for it to go down through the atmosphere, reflect off the ground and come back to the sensor that's on the satellite. Laser beams can be precisely aimed, so you can get specific targets or make effective scanning systems that move the field of view of the, the sensor back and forth, something that microwave radar systems can't do. In fact, for this application, microwave would be a better uh, solution because it could penetrate clouds which LiDAR cannot, um, but you can't focus microwave onto uh, a precise enough spot and you can't scan it backwards and forwards. So our old wavelength um, uh, figure, 
This is showing you the range of wavelengths that are used typically in LIDAR systems. So 1540, so out just beyond the near infrared. Um, Toposys systems use this. Um, Mid IR is extremely, um, well, there's very little background noise in the mid IR and it's eye safe. So th that's a good choice. Um, most LIDAR lasers, however, are in the range between 1047 and 1064 nanometers. And this includes Optech, um, the Aeroscan systems, Topi, uh, Datus, Altimus, and I should mention Leica, the Leica ALS, Airborne Laser Scanner. Um, these numbers are not arbitrary. They're based on what particular material you're using to laze with. Uh, and yes, that is a real word, laze. Um, so certain doped silicon compounds will laze at 1064. So that's what you would have. Um, 1064 um, is so an area that is high reflectance in both soil and vegetation. So that's a good choice and a popular choice among these sensors. Um, for bathymetry, which is basically just the topography of surfaces underwater, we need to go and, and do something near the blue. And so what we do is we take the 1064 light and we put it into a frequency doubler, which is a, a little crystal that does what it seems like. Light comes in at 1064 and out at 532. So the frequency has been doubled, therefore the wavelength must be half. 532 is half of 1064. Um, and so that gives you the ability to penetrate water to some extent. Um, so those systems generally have both a 1064 and a 532 um, nanometers to get at bathymetry. So you have one beam that bounces off the top of the water curve surface and one that penetrates down to, you hope, the lower surface. The ability to penetrate water is very dependent upon the turbidity of the water. So if you know what a Secchi disk is, it's a little tool for determining what turbidity is um, based on looking at a, a black and white disk and seeing how long you can see the black and white pattern as you lower it into the water. Uh, most of these bathymetric systems can see the you know, around four Secchi disks. So you're doing a lot better than your eye, but beyond 10 meters or so, um, they can become unreliable unless you're in very, very clear water. And finally, there's a, there have been some systems that have worked at 900 nanometers. Um, so like the fly map system works there. But again, in general, it's about 1064 for uh, terrestrial observations and about 532 along with 1064 for bathymetric observations. So what about these pulses? Well, um, the technology for these pulses has increased um, incredibly. The lasers have gotten um, so they can emit more pulses in the same amount of time. Um, and their shorter duration. I just want to go over some general rules of thumb. So how many pulses can you create per second? Well, um, between you know, 25 and 500 kilohertz. Now a kilohertz is a thousand times per second. Therefore you can get speeds up to half a million pulses per second. And that allows you to lie down a lot of pulses and a very short amount of time, which means that you can fly faster than you would with slower repetition rates. The horizontal pulse width, so as the pulse is leaving the, um, the aircraft, um, it can be as small as 10 centimeters, it could be as high as 150 centimeters. 
the vertical pulse duration. So the pulse is, is going to be emitted. And so at one part, the pulse starts and then it ends. And that vertical duration can be um, between six and 12 nanoseconds. Now, that duration is associated with a depth. So for instance, the, the six to 12 nanoseconds is converted to a pulse depth of 1.8 to 3.6 meters. And that's because um, distance traveled by light in one nanosecond is about 30 centimeters. Uh, and that uh, is equivalent in a two-way distance travel to about 15 centimeters. That is an object 15 centimeters away, the pulse will come back in um, one nanosecond because you're traveling, um, the, the light has to travel both ways. Secondly, the pulse doesn't, it isn't instantaneous. That is the speed of the pulse, uh, I'm sorry, the, the power in the pulse is not uniform vertically. The laser sort of uh, increases in power and decreases in power as pulses are being emitted. So what you have is it's within that, that column of light that's traveling down, well, in this case, it's traveling sideways, but in a system, it's going to be traveling downward, you have a distribution of power. Um, so you can think of the x-axis on this graph as being time or space, and you have uh, increasing and then decreasing illumination. And in the laser world, they strive for something that approximates a Gaussian pulse, just because it simplifies the math. However, we very often get a Rayleigh pulse, same Rayleigh who uh, discovered Rayleigh scattering. Um, and in that case, the pulse takes a little longer to, uh, a little longer time to decrease in power. And thinking that laser pulses are instantaneous or near instantaneous is probably the biggest misconception about LIDAR, because as we'll see, it does have effect on how you interpret the data. So for instance, look at the graph on the left. We're just gonna imagine that we have some kind of surface and surface area is one unit um, and there are five surfaces that are spread out, um, not overlapping um, in some area. We're going to get a LIDAR pulse from them. Um, that is, we're going to emit LIDAR energy and record the amount of energy that's returning. And what you can see is, you know, the what you're going to get um, in your receiver is going to be the surface area uh, of the object sort of convolved is the way we would say it with the pulse and the pulse power over time. So if that pulse is five nanoseconds long, you go to that next um, figure there, you'd expect that that's what your return pulses would look like. You know, they're quite narrow. Um, although as you get to that last pulse at the bottom, you can see they're there are two objects there and the pulses overlap. Um, that's just because as the energy from one um, object is decaying, the energy from the other object is increasing. And so there's no point where you get back to zero. And as you go into the third and the fourth panel here, what you see is that the wider the pulse, um, which you can also think of as the the longer in time the pulse, um, the more smooth the, the signal gets. So that now, not only for those two panels, not only are the last two um, uh, returns unable to be, um, are, you're unable to separate them, the last three returns are, are now um, such that you can't separate them. And that's going to change how we process 
or the result we get when we process the data from the LIDAR. And that's just the same thing, but it's for late Rayleigh-shaped um, pulses. So not only is the laser pulse um, got a temporal um, difference in the amount of power, there's also a spatial distribution of power within the beam. So the beam is more intense near the center than it is near the edges. Okay, And this, again, in theory, the distribution is Gaussian. There are some lasers that have hot spots and it complicates things, but in general, at least they're striving for a Gaussian distribution. Beam widths are generally given in terms of the width in which 86.5% of the total energy is found. So when they tell you that you know it's one meter uh, beam width, actually there's some energy that falls outside of that limit. In fact, there's 13.5% uh, of that image, uh, that energy. So this means that the same amount of the same material intersecting the laser beam at the same angle can return different amounts of energy to the sensor depending on its position in the beam. If you have a small object and it's in the center of the beam, it's going to return more energy than if it's somewhere near the end or the edge of the beam. Okay, all of that was creating the LiDAR pulse. Now what happens? Well, the, uh, the energy has to travel to the ground. And the laser itself is, is very uh, directional. That is, you can point it, I mean, you, you have lasers that do topographic sensing that have like a, a five kilometer range. They're using, used in mining to figure out what the, how much mass has been removed from a, a surface. So there are ones that go that, that far. And for that application, you probably want the beam to be the same diameter throughout it, the, the line that it's following. However, for LIDAR, you, you don't want it to be that um, compact. You want it to be spread out a little bit, both for eye safety and because you want to captured data that's sort of going to be averaged over a larger, what we would say is a larger footprint, the footprint being the intersection of the beam and the ground surface. So um, simple formula, as always, you don't need the formula, but I might ask you about how things vary. Um, so the laser footprint width as it intersects, whatever it's intersecting, is equal to the altitude above the ground level times this gamma, which is divergence in radians. A radian is 57.3 degrees. Uh, and it's just more convenient to work in radians. So the, the beam size in meters at an AGL of 1,000 meters is the value of the beam divergence in millirads. So um, if it's 1,000 meters and you've got a uh, 0.5 millirad uh, divergent, then it's going to be, well, then it's going to be uh, um, 500 meters. So that would be a bad example. Um, um, so it's millirads that are used. Uh, and so that's a thousandth of a, a rad. So this is the this is the part I need to come back to is you could have your laser in technic technically not have very much divergence. We have to spread out the beam to make it a little larger. So what happens when the laser beam hits a target? Well, if it just hits a um, a smooth surface, it's just going to bounce right back and be hopefully recorded by the sensor. Uh, I say hopefully because it's possible it's going to hit a cloud on the way back or a duck. Uh, you never know what. Um, of course, I'm interested in uh, vegetation. So I think about cases where you might have a dense 
um, area of trees or a sparse area of trees. And the denser the trees, the more returns you're going to get from the surface of the canopy and the fewer you're going to get from the land surface. And for vegetation, this is going to turn out to be key. So it's traveling down. It's going to interact with whatever surfaces it uh, interacts with. And as we'll see, you can get the range to more than one surface for a given pulse. Now, this is an important distinction, which is that the LIDAR cannot go through materials in general. Um, if something was highly transparent, it could. But in general, um, it's not going to pass through objects like, for instance, leaves, but rather it's going to penetrate through the canopy. So it's not penetration through the leaves. It's just these tiny um, areas, tiny areas within the uh, canopy where you have a, a direct line of sight down to the ground. And, you know, the laser um, emitting photons, you know, various things can go on with the photons. Um, they can either be bounced off of the surface and return to the sensor. Um, so that's canopy penetration. You might have um, multiple scattering events inside the canopy, although those are probably pretty rare, or you can have photon loss. Um, so the problem you run into is, let's just assume for the moment that the height of the first object that's encountered by the laser beam, um, you know, the height or the, the range, you could think of it the other way, is the only information recorded. As you increase beam size, it's going to reduce the penetration of the canopy because if you can only move me measure one range, then whatever it hits first, all the energy uh, that's going to be seen is from that first return. And therefore, you're never going to hit the ground or you'll hit the ground a lot less frequently than you would otherwise. And this is important because, for instance, for trees, you need to have two elevations in order to get what you're interested in, which is generally metrics related to height. If you don't get the ground surface, then you're not going to be able to get that elevation and you're not going to get the height of the objects themselves. And then the one other thing that can happen with these uh, photons, and most photons suffer this horrible fate, which is they're scattered off in directions that don't allow them to get back to the receiver. So they came so close. They were in a they were in a laser. They were emitted from a laser. They hit a target, but then they were reflected off in all sorts of or scattered off in all sorts of different directions, and no longer could contribute to the lidar process. Okay, so we've created a pulse. It's traveled to the target. It's interacted with the target. Then it travels back to the sensor. Now about processing of the return signal. So you can imagine laser illumination. Um, They're shown in a, a green beam. It's labeled the top. Um, passing down um, through the atmosphere and then um, uh, interacting with uh, a branch that has some foliage in it and then uh, interacting with two dead branches and then interacting with a little shrub there and then the ground surface and that return signal um, we refer to as a waveform okay so the more material that the laser pulse is interacting with the more power that's going to be returned and so that's the return signal waveform and we will return to this in figuring out um, how we're going to process this return signal waveform. Now, the simplest thing you can do, in a sense, is simply record the entire waveform. And this is work that I did when I was uh, doing my PhD. So you have some energy being returned. Um, 
you know, the first energy that's returned, uh, that is the energy from foliage closest to the top of the canopy. Um, so that's going to be the top of the canopy. It's going to be, you know, below the sort of background noise level of the LIDAR receiver. It's going to increase past that. Um, and then you're going to have a, a fairly rapid increase in the amount of power that's returned. And that peak of those returns um, where, you know, in this case, where the travel time is about 60 nanoseconds or the distance, the distance there is normalized to the top of the canopy is about 20 meters. That peak is generally what we think of as canopy closure. That's where the variability of the upper canopy surface has uh, been reduced and you're basically, you've got all canopy. And then the power uh, that's coming back is decreasing. That's not because the amount of stuff in the canopy is becoming um, lower. What it means is that you already return a big chunk of the uh, number of, uh, of the photons and the power is decreasing because there's less and less source energy to be returned. Um, you might see a nice little gap there, like at like 110 through 130 nanoseconds, where you have a lower foliage um, in the uh, lower amount of foliage um, in the understory. And then in this case, we see a little bit, you know, maybe a meter or two of increase, and that could be understory vegetation. You then hopefully get some kind of ground return. So some fraction of the energy gets through the entire canopy and is returned by the ground because the ground is a solid um, surface. You're going to get uh, return energy that's generally greater than you would get from the canopy. And so I've colored that in as brown. It wouldn't be colored in in brown. You'd have to um, run some statistical analyses to figure out where the ground return is. So that is what I consider to be the sort of simpler thing to do with the LiDAR pulse, is just record all the energy that's being returned. Um, and there are a lot of commercial systems now. Uh, research systems tend to work that way. There are a lot of commercial systems that work that way now, but they're still mostly using what we would call the discrete return method. And that is, Instead of digitizing all of that energy, what you're doing is, um, sorry, what you're doing is picking out a few heights that seem to be important. And the first type of lasers um, used uh, only first returns. That is, um, you see the threshold there. As the energy that's being returned passes that threshold, becomes greater than that threshold, a return is being um, noted by the receiver. Um, later, um, first and last return sensors were developed. So you get that first return, and then the, the forward edge of the last return, when you increase past that threshold, that is also recorded. Why the, the first and the last? Well, because if you're looking at things like vegetation, what you want is, you know, you want the, the height or elevation of the top of the canopy and the height or elevation of the ground surface, and that's how you get them. Um, more commonly these days, you have multiple return systems. So you might get three returns, or even four or five returns. Curiously, um, you won't get all the, if you run out of returns in the canopy, so like it's a highly variable canopy, you're recording four returns. If, you're, if you don't um, get all those returns um, recorded, that is if you're a digitizer, can't record um, more than the number of returns you have, 
it just drops off the last return. And this is where we get to the problem that we talked about in terms of the pulse um, length or pulse duration. Um, that is, if you um, have, I've put in more trees here at the bottom of this figure. Um, if you have foliage at the bottom of the canopy, for instance, um, that's going to occlude the, the ground surface. And so um, um, there's going to be more power in that range of heights. And so you're no longer seeing the ground surface. You're seeing this new surface indicated in red. And so your height is going to be, your last height is going to be moved up. Um, and this is, you'll see a major problem with using LIDAR. And this is an example. I like this because um, the, the person who developed this um, came up with a great name for it. So in the upper left hand, uh, in the upper left hand uh, panel, what we have there is a, a shaded, a hill shaded uh, map of the elevation uh, um, of a LIDAR surface from a LIDAR surface. And then at the, just to the right of that, we have an image where we have the, again, hill shaded uh, DEM from the, the a raw uh, or bare earth, um, I should say raw, um, uh, DEM that has been processed to take off the upper canopy. Okay, And if you look down at the lower left-hand corner, we have a graph. It's that little transect location that's marked in either yellow or red above it. And what we see is the top upper canopy surface in red. And then what we're thinking is the ground surface in yellow. The fact is that's not the ground surface okay if if it was the ground surface we would think that the upper vegetation would more closely follow it um, or vice versa the ground surface would more closely follow the surface in terms of its variability not in terms of its absolute height but in terms of the relative height but in fact what you've got there is a situation where you're not getting the real last return you're getting some other return out of the system and i just like the fact that the guy who did this was like french canadian and i'll butcher this but he called this les moutons and because he thought they looked like little sheep grazing out in the in the forest i always thought that was funny so as i was saying increasing pulse width or duration has the effect of increasing the height of the topographic surfaces developed using data from a, a leading edge detecting LIDAR. So that's a major problem. Here you see the waveform being smooth and you, it has the same effect as having vegetation in the uh, bottom of the canopy. Um, that signal, because it's smooth, never goes below the threshold, which means it never can then be in the position of increasing over the threshold and so it's not marked and so that last return therefore gets bumped up to where i'm showing the red line and there are various uh, different ways of dealing with this problem um, like the figure i was showing you before you can just record multiple observations or multiple discrete returns um, um, you can have two thresholds Okay, so you can record both the leading and the trailing thresholds of each of the uh, each of the returns, the uh, return energy. Um, you can then average those together to get a, a multi-threshold uh, approach with a centroid instead of the leading and trailing edge. And you can do photon counting sampling, and that's a relatively new technology. Um, where you can um, record the travel times of individual photons. 
So it's very, very sensitive. It's got its problems with background noise because it is so sensitive, but it is an approach people are using now. Waveform recording is not subject to signal processing errors. So in the discrete return case, you've got um, uh, the receiver basically making decisions about what ranges are significant. And with waveform recording LiDAR, you just collect all the data. You can make those choices and select thresholds and that sort of thing um, in, the, in the lab. And you can adjust these things. In a discrete return system, that's all going to be determined for you uh, by the receiver itself. Uh, it has an enhanced ability to characterize the canopy structure since it's getting the whole thing. Um, it has the ability to concisely describe canopy uh, information over large areas. Um, very often you don't want um, the number of points you're going to get per meter squared because these days they fly with crazy numbers, like 12 um, um, points per meter squared. And that's just a lot of information to process. Very large files, um, you know, um, data, si bleh, data sizes, you know, file sizes at around, you know, 100 gigabytes or 500 gigabytes. And there's a global data sets that have been collected uh, the ISAT program, and then currently the JEDI program, which is Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, which is a LIDAR that sits on the ISS, International Space Station. Uh, I really begged and pleaded for them not to call it JEDI, but what are you going to do? Remote sensing scientists are a bunch of nerds. Um, the advantages of the discrete return system, you get higher spatial resolution. Um, you get smaller diameter footprints and higher pulse repetition rates. And you do get a certain flexibility in data processing because you have so much data to work with. But the biggest advantage is availability. Um, commercial systems in general have been this kind of system, although some people are changing over to um, commercial waveform recording systems. Um, but, you know, you can get these uh, essentially for waveform form recording systems. These have been research systems um, and discrete return has been commercial systems. Again, that's changing to some degree, but you'd still probably get um, um, more discrete return systems that you could you could purchase data from or purchase a data collection flight from, um, from a commercial vendor. And here is just a nice comparison of discrete return and waveform recording LIDAR, what you would expect. This is actually at the Wind River Canopy Crane, which was kind of a crazy project done where they actually put a construction crane out in the middle of a Douglas Spur Western Hemlock Forest, and you could ride around in a little gondola and I've done this, you ride around in it and you see the various parts of the canopy. And there was a lot of good science done there. And there was also my work um, where we mapped the uh, surfaces of uh, just a, a couple of trees here that you're seeing and also uh, simulated what a waveform would look like. Okay, so we have processed the return signal. Uh, either by looking at a waveform or um, uh, recording a series of uh, pulse returns. We now have to scan. But so far, we've, all we've done is emit one pulse and record um, the information from the, the backscattered radiation from that point. So the way we do this is by scanning just like um, uh, the cross track scanners we've already talked about. Um, you either have an oscillating mirror, so the mirror is the dark line there in the upper left hand panel, and light is coming in from the left, and that mirror is being 
uh, rotated back and forth so that you're scanning um, different points on the ground. Um, and there are a variety of different um, systems that, that have different ways of um, moving that mirror. The simplest thing you could do is it uh, is what Leica does, which is it's sinusoidal. That is the mirror. Um, it actually um, slows down as you get to the end of one of these traces, you know, whether it's the far left or the far right, right? Because you're looking at this in sort of plan view, these points on the ground, um, and then it speeds up as it's near the center. Um, they do that because if you don't, then the mirror itself can break because, you know, it's going, if you stop it, um, you're gonna have a, just immediately stop it, you're gonna have serious problems with the mechanical stability. So that's one approach, you can make a sinusoid. Um, Optech, another big manufacturer, uses a Z pattern. So in this case, you're, um, you're drawing a line with equal space, LIDAR observations, and then drawing it back and forth. Um, there have also been parallel systems. In this case, you just drive it forward and then drive another lane forward. You don't use the back um, motion. And this is a type of scanner I like. This is using a rotating polygon. Um, so that's a mirrored surface on the edge of those, that polygon. And that's going to give you the parallel um, observations that we were looking at. There are lots of other things. Um, there have been fiber scanners. So the laser pulse is uh, directed into one or another um, um, of a, a line of optical fibers. Um, and so um, they go one after another. And what happens is you wind up with these beautiful lines of uh, footprints on the ground. There's also the Palmer scanner. The interesting thing about the Palmer scanner is you look forward and you look backward at the things you're flying over. And so you have a chance to get two observations. And if you're doing work like on uh, ice sheets and you have crevasses that you really need to get into, in order to understand the topography. This gives you two chances to get in the crevasse, depending on where the plane is and whether the scanner is looking forward or back at that time. Um, so this is just to show you the conventional Z pattern used by Optech sensors. That yellow line is the, um, the flight line of the plane and you're going back and forth with these pulses. Um, one thing to note is when you purchase LiDAR data, they will say, we're gonna get you 12 shots per meter squared, which sounds great. But in fact, if you look at it carefully, what you'll realize is that there are large areas between each of those cross track swaths where there is no data. So, the, there isn't one number that can describe the number of returns on the ground surface. There's a distribution. Some areas have more, some areas have less. And that's just something to keep in mind. Um, as in aerial photography, you need side lap between um, data uh, passes in order to assure that you have complete coverage. Um, so in the upper right hand, what they're showing you is that dark blue area. That's where you have two lines or two transects overlapping. You have double the, the density. And that can be very useful, for instance, for quality control purposes. You know, you have a, a red colored pass and a green colored pass. And if you compare your results for each one, in this case, there's a whatever a one centimeter difference between what the elevations are in one uh, pass and the next pass, and you can use that information to correct that data.
One important factor when uh, looking at LiDAR is to check out what scan angles they use. So common sensors are capable of scanning across 14 to 75 degrees. Now that's two-sided. That is plus or minus seven degrees and plus or minus 37.5 degrees. Um, in practice, that kind of large scan angle leads to problems with the resulting data. Um, and so they do so because you're no longer hitting, it's, it's like displacement. You're no longer hitting the top of the object. You are, um, you're getting data back from the side. And similar to you know, the distance from Nader, that is a big effect in displacement, the scan angle here is the factor that leads to uh, the most error. So you wanna keep those scan angles um, narrow enough that you're, you're, that effect doesn't overwhelm the other effects in the data. Um, so if you wanted to extract the ground surface of crowded areas with buildings in the city, you can probably go up to a scan angle of plus or minus 10 degrees if you're looking for a ground service in say a coniferous forest, a scan angle of 45 degrees uh, maximum, two-sided, is what you want to do. Um, and some would say that even that that's too much. Unfortunately, the narrower your scan angle, the more passes you have to make because each one of your swaths is going to be um, uh, smaller. And so you have to fly more and that costs money. So there got to be some compromises. Okay, so we now have points. We have scanned them on the surface and now we're gonna create some products. And the products you're looking for are basically two. One of which it can be a, a digital surface model. So that's the topographic data but it's of the first service that's intersected by the laser. So it might be vegetation, it might be a ground surface, it might be trees near a house, it could be the house um, uh, or a large building. And we refer this as to this as the digital surface model um, because it's an elevation model and it's on the surface. Um, a, we were, we use digital elevation model only to refer to the elevation of the ground surfaces. And so the next part um, that's going to be necessary is to do some kind of filtering on your original data set and turn your digital surface model into a digital elevation model. Now, some people use the term digital terrain model um, to mean digital elevation model. And, it probably makes sense to use digital terrain model because then that um, tells you exactly what you're looking at. So what we need to do in order to get at the DTM is to do point classification or filtering. DTM uh, is digital terrain model. So we need to remove all the points above the bare earth surface. And the process of doing that is uh, can be called point classification or filtering. And it's the necessary prerequisite to analyze topography or surface conditions um, as the bare earth elevation is almost always needed. Now this wouldn't be true in a perfectly bare, you know, perfectly bare surface. So like an ice sheet or the Bonneville flats, but generally if you've got any kind of vegetation or similar, you're gonna have to do the point classification So what's the error budget for a surface model? Well, your Z error is going to be a function of measurement error, classification error, and interpolation error. So the measurement error is, you know, the sort of fundamental, how well can we measure the, um, the surface location? Not thinking about what kind of surface it is or where it is in the canopy or uh, and that's about 15 centimeters vertical and 50 centimeters horizontal. Now you might wonder why those two things are different. Um, 
15 centimeter vertical is basically the accuracy of the GPS. That's the error that is on that particular measurement, the, the elevation of the plane. The 50 centimeter horizontal is due to the uh, IMU um, or the INS, the inertial measurement unit or the inertial navigation system, because it's harder to measure the roll and pitch of the plane than it is to measure its location. So um, that's why you have two separate components of measurement. It's actually due to the errors in two different parts of the sensing system. Interpolation error, we'll see. Um, as you take away points that are not on the surface, um, you're gonna have to fill them in somehow. You were gonna use some kind of interpolation. That's a function of how many points there are um, on the ground surface and to some extent the canopy cover. And the classification error is a function of vegetation height. That's because if you make a misclassification uh, and call a canopy return, a ground return, then the higher the vegetation, the more of a difference you're gonna get, all of the things being equal. So misidentifying canopy as ground is much worse than misidentifying ground as canopy. Um, again, if you misidentify canopy and think it's ground, you're gonna have uh, your ground suddenly come up from the rest of the surface around it. Whereas if you misidentify the ground as canopy, it's just going to be you have another point lying down near the ground surface. Um, that is that is canopy. That doesn't really affect your processing. Um, however, if you're talking about point classification, if your algorithm tries to make um, as much, uh, as many of the points as possible canopy, then you're going to wind up with too few points on the ground surface, and therefore you get a larger interpolation error. So the errors are not independent. Issues for doing point filtering. Um, the first one is just the volume of data. You know, for a county level project, you could have 3 billion points for, for about 2,600 kilometers squared. That's a lot of points, not only to store, but to process. There are a number of uh, classification or filtering algorithms that have been developed. Many are proprietary, so you don't know what's going on uh, inside the algorithm. Um, the filters have not been tested for different data sets with various types of landscape features. Um, so, there's not a, a good way of knowing what parameters you need to supply to the algorithm in order to get good results. They just kind of uh, play with the various um, parameters that can affect the filtering or classification algorithms and until they have something they think is right. Um, and they do have GPS um, error, I'm sorry, GPS observations that they do in the field in order to figure out, um, you know, have some way to independently verify the DTM that they're creating. Um, some of the errors are not going to be documented very well, um, unless you really insist on it. Um, and the sensitivity of these filters to the parameters that go into them um, and the sensitivity to data resolution generally has not been analyzed. Uh, because you have proprietary systems. There are a couple of different approaches to point classification. Um, there's a, a slope base system. And what that system says essentially is any point that is more than um, any point which relative to the point around it implies a slope of greater than some threshold, that's gonna be canopy, right? Because slopes only go up to a certain amount. There's the block minimum approach. And that's an approach where you say any pixel that's not within a few meters of the ground surface 
is going to be a canopy system uh, point. There's a surface-based system where you're fitting uh, equations to the data you have. And if a point has a, a large residual uh, from that surface, then that's a canopy point. And then there's clustering and segmentation approaches that I won't get into. Um, but basically, it's finding objects um, that are higher than the rest of the, the surrounding um, points and classifying the ones that are higher as canopy. So block minimum algorithms are very popular, they're commonly used. Um, basically, it's just saying that the ground return should be the lowest elevations in, an, in a local neighborhood. Um, but of course, you're going to have some neighborhoods where you don't have any ground um, or where you certainly might not have any ground surfaces. So that's a problem that you get. Um, so it has the potential to be biased low in high slope areas because the minimum elevation um, of a certain footprint is always going to be the lowest point. Um, in an area, so that's going to bias you low. And you can use multiple or overlapping spatial filters, just showing that a little bit on the right. Uh, there's a, an approach called the uh, elevation threshold with expanding window, which kind of looks at the minimal, I'm sorry, the, the minimum elevation as you look over larger and larger blocks or larger and larger um, areas on the ground from say one meter to two meters to four to eight to 16. And at some point, you're not, you're not going to see any change in the elevation of the DTM because you have found the ground surface. Um, if you have small blocks, right, the minimum may be at the top of the canopy. The larger the block, the more likely it is that the minimum elevation is going to be on the ground surface. And so, yeah, when the block size has increased to the point at which the minimum elevations converge, the points that make up those minimum elevations are mapped and a surface cre is created from them. So that on the right is just showing you an example where you've got um, various objects um, that are being scanned. And so it's a trees in a field, um, you can tell. And then below that is the same uh, data, but we've removed everything that appears to be canopy. It seems to have done a pretty good job. What you would then do is use an interpolator to figure out what the, um, the elevations are, where the, the points from the digital surface model have been removed. And this just gives you a sense. Um, these tend to be iterative approaches, right? So you start with your in the upper left with all your data, and you run one of uh, one of these analyses and get rid of a certain amount of canopy, and then more canopy, and finally you're left with something that looks pretty smooth and appears to be the bare earth surface. Okay, so this is where we get into my work and. As a graduate student, I was sort of fundamentally interested in canopy structure, which uh, a friend of mine, Jess Parker, defined as the organization in space and time, including the position, the extent, the quantity, the type, and connectivity of the above ground components of vegetation. And it had long been known that you could think of uh, forest development as occurring in four stages. The stand initiation stage, where you have a lot of small trees, the stem exclusion stage where a couple of trees become dominant and start shading the trees beneath them. Uh, the understory reinitiation phase where some of those medium sized trees start dying off and that lets in enough light for the understory. And finally, the old growth stage where you wind up having trees of different size. Um, Jess Parker was doing um, what he called foliage height profiles. So looking at the vertical distribution of foliage as a function of height, only he was using a camera to do it. And he came up with very similar classes, young stand, um, intermediate stand, which is sort of the time exclusion stand, 
where most of the foliage is at high um, height within the, uh, the canopy, mature stage or understory initiation stage where there is still have uh, a lot of foliage high up in the canopy, but now there's a lot of uh, foliage associated with shrubs and small trees. And then finally, the old growth phase where you have an even mix of um, uh, foliage uh, amounts at various heights. This camera approach was actually developed by Robert uh, H. MacArthur and uh, John Aber to, in order to look at foliage in ter for uh, bird studies. Um, and I don't have time to get into it, but they created an index that would look at these same forest height profiles and they called it the forest height um, diversity or foliage height diversity and found that you could plot that against bird species diversity and come up with a nice relationship, which is what's there on the right. So um, it was well known that these canopy height um, distributions were potentially important, but um, going out and making the measurements with cameras was extremely difficult. Now, I had access to this LIDAR and therefore I had access to um, vertical distributions of the canopy that um, were relatively easy to get. And here's an example of some data of that type that were collected at um, the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, which I've talked about before. It's this forest in the Pacific Northwest. And on the top, you see about a four kilometer transect of um, waveform LIDAR data. And of course, the areas that are red are where there's a lot of foliage, areas where they're blue, not a lot of foliage. And I could look in and look at a, a young stand, that's panel B, um, or a mature stand, or an old growth stand, and pick out each one of these patterns that um, just Parker and the forestry people had developed for different stand stages. So that was pretty exciting. And so I started working on trying to uh, uh, figure out how you could measure height from these uh, canopy waveforms and immediately got very nice results. So on the right, you've got a field derived maximum um, height uh, and um, field derived maximum tree height. And you've got the mean height of dominant and codominants, the largest trees. And the mean height of a slicer waveform. And you can see not only do these match, um, not only their high correlation between each, but um, they're, they're actually, there's been no adjustments here. You're directly measuring maximum height or this mean height of dominance and codominance. So that was pretty exciting. Um, a few years later in my postdoc, I looked at uh, a set of sites in the Pacific Northwest um, coming from the driest site, uh, Ponderosa Pine, um, then up to a, a short site, True Fir at Mount Rainier, um, down to Douglas Fir, uh, Western Hemlock Forest in the H.J. Andrews. Um, a variety of Douglas Fir and Western Hemlock in the coast range of Oregon, and finally Sitka Spruce Western Hemlock in Cascade Head, Oregon. Uh, and these all fall out on a gradient of increasing productivity. You know, the further you are along that line, the more productive uh, the system. And so the question I asked was, well, could you come up with relationships between the waveform characteristics and um, these uh, various, very varying um, forests throughout the area? And the answer was uh, you could. So the colors represent which site you're at and the, uh, the, there are regression, line, regression lines for each site individually. And what you find is that for things like above ground biomass for maximum DBH or mean DBH of dominant and co-dominant stems, over and over again, you get these very regular patterns. 
so you don't have to know what site you're at. You get um, you get the same relationship between height indices and um, the measurements that you would make in the field. And here are some more basal area that works. Um, the mean DBH of stems, which is a really hard one, hmm, more or less works. Uh, the leaf area index, which we've talked about, the number of leaves above a point in the forest. And what's interesting about that is that, in essence, we are making a prediction of leaf area index, the area of leaves, from the volume that it occurs in. So I always found that interesting. Here are just some other ones. Basically, by the time I was done, I had so many variables that I could predict from the LIDAR that I kind of had to write a, a paper saying you shouldn't predict so many variables because they're all interrelated. So um, you should pick a couple uh, variables and work with those and not do what I did, which was uh, predict so many different indices. And here's an example of what you're getting when you're done processing your data. These are maximum heights for an area in um, Isle Royale Island. This is work from uh, Mike Falkowski. And so red areas are higher, blue areas are lower. Um, so maximum height is obviously one thing you can get from these systems. The work I just showed you was uh, done using LIDAR that was just narrow transects of data, 50 meters wide and then hundreds of kilometers long. The work I'm going to show you now was done by Mike Falkowski using large areas of LIDAR collected by a commercial sensor. Uh, total canopy cover. So if you know how many points in a particular area hit the ground, then you can use that percentage of all the points that have hit the ground as an estimate of canopy cover. Now, the interesting thing is you can then look at the canopy cover at any level. So this is giving you an estimate of just the understory canopy cover, places where you have, say, shrubs or small trees that are under taller trees. So lots of applications um, for um, forest LIDAR, um, inventory, of course, but there are also um, sort of more subtle applications. So this here is uh, LIDAR used with a uh, wildlife habitat suitability model. So it's essentially coming up with an index that tells you how suitable a particular area is for a hairy woodpecker. This could be done in the field, but it can also be done with estimates of um, forest structure variables such as basal area or the density of snags that you can get from LIDAR remote sensing. So you've got actually published habitats, habitat suitability models. You plug the LIDAR data in in place of field measurements of basal area and snag density. And then you get a map of habitat areas and you can look at the areas of high habitat availability and uh, um, you can prioritize those areas for habitat conservation. Uh, here's a great application. This is work that's done at CSU and was kind of pioneered at CSU. Um, in tropical landscapes in particular, you have uh, archaeological features that you wouldn't notice in the field because it just looks like topographic variability. But um, you, you might notice it if you were right on top of it. Um, but it's very hard to see. It's, it's impossible to see from the air, certainly, and very difficult uh, oftentimes to, to see the whole pattern in the um, when you're in the field. So, um, and I threw this in, there are also terrestrial LIDAR sensors and they, um, rather than pointing down um, to get a canopy, they're pointed sideways. 
so that um, you're doing the typical LIDAR process, but um, you're, you're looking sideways. And that's the only way I can put it. So there we have a forest example. Uh, there's also a lot of archaeological work uh, that's done with these in order to um, document what areas were like. So review in LIDAR, as in so many other things in life, it's all about timing. LIDAR sensors measure the distance between the sensor and the target by recording the time it takes for a pulse of emitted light to be reflected off the target and returned to the sensor. Pulses are not instantaneous, but rather they have a duration or width and shape that in the return signal is convolved with the intercepted surface area of the target. Beam width is critical to many IDAR applications, especially those involving forests or other vegetation with high cover. Most light seen by the sensor will be reflected off the first surface it encounters. Almost all penetration will occur be through gaps in between surfaces, i.e. leaves. LIDAR return signals summarize the distribution of intercepted surfaces they encounter. They can either be digitized into waveforms or processed into one or more discrete return distances. Laser scanning patterns have to be fully understood to ensure adequate coverage during LIDAR data collection. Many scanning densities and patterns that are, are just fine for topographic mapping are not appropriate for our natural resource applications. And LIDAR is still not a mature, i.e. a standardized technology like photogrammetry. Understanding each individual sensor and the biases associated with its measurements is critically important.